the next option we're going to talk, we're going to call option three. And uh, this producer is recognizing the value of these home raised animals, doesn't quite want to get rid of the whole factory, uh, but recognizes the extreme forage shortage and really is not very excited about buying an additional two tons of hay per cow, especially during these high, high priced hay years. So, what is he going to do? He's going to completely liquidate the cow herd. He's going to go ahead and pull the trigger on all, uh, all of his cows. Um, he's going to keep all those yearling calves that he carried over this last winter and, uh, and expose every one of those heifer calves to breeding. So, sell cows, keep yearlings, expose all heifers. So perhaps if you were to consider this option, you would take a, a, maybe a, a little bit combination between option number one and option number three. Perhaps you wouldn't sell all the cows, maybe you'd keep the younger cows, the two-year-olds, the three-year-olds, uh, whatever they might be, and as well as these yearling heifers. But what's he thinking here? Well, if, he, if we look at the numbers on this one again, that in terms of AUMs, what does he have out there? Again, we're the middle of May, we're going to be out of grass the first of June if we don't do anything. So if, if we go ahead and send all these pairs to town, keep these yearlings, the, the steers and the heifer calves, and expose all those heifers to breeding. Okay? Essentially, we will, in the year, over 100 bred heifers that they, then we can choose to retain into our herd and start building back that cow herd. Uh, we could sell these steer calves if the picture continues to get more bleak. Uh, we could go ahead and send those steer calves to town, further reducing our forage demands. But essentially, if that's the only livestock that we have, or these yearlings that we're going to take through the wintertime, this, this hay that we raise at home, even though we're only raising half the normal amount of hay, we'll probably be able to keep those through the winter with uh, very little, if any, additional purchase feed. So, uh, what are the benefits of this scenario? Well, we're going to have our home-raised genetics. We're going to keep that base that we can start back from, um, and, and we're not going to have to spend money buying these outside inputs. So, which is right? Well, I don't know. Uh, there's benefits, I think, to each of these scenarios. Uh, there's certainly downsides to each of these. This one is very cash costly during this year. It's going to take you several years to rebuild. This one, you're going to essentially start over with your cow herd in terms of your genetics. This one, you're starting over to a large degree, but not quite from scratch. Uh, you've still got some, some stalker options there that you can pursue as well. So uh, I think each of these options are, are worth considering. Perhaps there's a combination of some of these that you could consider as well. Um, but there's a piece of information that I haven't shared with you yet that we need to discuss about this ranch. And I think this is an important piece of information. So what is that piece of information? Well, it is that this ranch is really comprised of four different enterprises. And if you think about this holistically, you'll understand that. And let's say this ranch is a profitable ranch. If we look back over the last five years and do a rolling average of income, this ranch has averaged $68,000 in returns, as returns to unpaid family labor, uh, equity, and management from the ag side of the ranch business. So this ranch has, has averaged $68,000 in returns over the last five years. So of all the different ranches I've analyzed in the last few years, I would say this ranch is a fairly profitable ranch looking at it. Uh, so of course, things outside of the ag business such as uh, gravel pits, uh, you know, any kind of minerals, pipeline, easements, those kind of things are outside of this analysis. But just looking at the ag side, uh, this ranch is doing pretty well. But I mentioned this ranch is made up of four enterprises. So what are those enterprises? Well, many of you probably recognize several of those. And the first is the cow-calf. Okay. This ranch is in the business of, of doing a cow-calf operation. What else did this ranch do? Well, they raise hay. Okay. Normally they raise about 400 ton of hay. Uh, this year it's only going to be about half of that. What else does this ranch do? Well, they, they also run stalkers. Stalkers. And the fourth enterprise on this ranch is the land business. Okay, That one may be a new one for you to think about in terms of an enterprise analysis of a ranch. But think of it this way. If this ranch didn't have cows, if this ranch didn't put up hay, and if this ranch did not run stalkers, 
would there still be an income source to this ranch? And the answer is yes. They could sell the grass, they could take in cattle, they could uh, do a cash lease on the whole ranch. Would the ranch still have expenses? Uh, sure, it'd have to pay uh, property tax, there'd be some general upkeep on the fences and the livestock waters, whatever other kind of infrastructure this ranch has. But really, those are the four businesses that this ranch is involved with. It's the cow-calf, the hay, the stockers, and the lamp. So here's the part I didn't tell you. Okay, Although this ranch is, is profitable, they made $68,000, each of these enterprises also had different levels of profitability. And if we had done an enterprise analysis on this ranch every year for the last five years and had those rolling average numbers, here's what they'd look like. So for our cow-calf business, for the last five years, they've averaged $22 thousand dollars a year is what the cow-calf business has added to the bottom line of this ranch business. The, uh, the stockers, well they've done pretty well. They, they've added thirty thousand dollars every year during the last five years on a rolling average. Some years it was much higher than that, other years it was much lower than that. Okay? But the stocker business is, is profitable. And the land business, well if they would have just cash leased the ranch or at least it by the AUM and then paid those expenses that the land business pays, things like property tax and infrastructure upkeep. Uh, the, stock, the land business has an income of $24,000. Okay, so again, these cows paid the land business for going great for grazing for that cows. The cows bought the hay from the hay business. Calves were sold at weaning to the stocker business, and the stockers sold those off grass the following year. Oh, I didn't tell you what the hay business made. Okay, so each of these were, were thousands. The hay business. I'm going to change the color of my marker. Over the last five years, it's averaged a negative $20,000 in returns over the last five years. So, that's what this ranch looks like. Now, with, with that, and the reason I didn't share this up front is, most ranchers don't know this information. Okay? It, it's not a, that, that's not a hit. That's just, a lot of our ranch businesses don't take the time to sit down and analyze their ranch in this kind of way to look at those different enterprises that we're doing on the ranch and allocate those costs and, and contribute those uh, and let those businesses take credit for the value that they're adding in the ways that they are. So with this information now, does that change which of these three scenarios would be more viable? Okay. Well, perhaps it does and perhaps it doesn't. Um, many folks would probably say, hey, well, the first thing we need to do in this drought is with these numbers is get out of the hay business. That may not be the right decision, especially if hay is going to be worth $200 a ton this year. And I think this producer's cost of making hay was right around $130, $140 a ton. Um, so there's going to be profit in that business this year, given the market scenario. Okay, So maybe getting out of the hay business during the short run is not the right solution. Um, but what I think this does is this hopefully will refocus our efforts on which one of our businesses is our strongest one and therefore which one do we need to capitalize on and make sure we don't eliminate that business and which one of these businesses probably needs to be either strengthened or considered for elimination. So um, a good example of this is if we stop thinking about a ranch and think of a business. A, a, a Fortune 500 business, and let's think of G, uh, GE, General Electric. So if, if GE is in the business of making uh, dishwashers, uh, light bulbs, and wind turbines, okay, those are all, and jet engines, those are all things they make, okay. If if uh, GE for some reason has some type of outside market uh, pressures that are going to affect the profitability of, of, of the entire GE. Okay, what should their response be? Okay, if, if, they, if the dishwasher business is highly profitable, but light bulbs are, are losing money, and now there's been an outside strain on this, on this large uh, corporation, do you think they need to get out of dishwashers and, and cut their most profitable business off uh, and, and still keep making light bulbs? Okay, I think that would be a, a good example of a bad decision made when outside pressures are put on you. So I think in the ranching business, we need to look at things the same way. So if we know that this cow-calf business is moderately profitable, the hay business is generally a loser, um, and the stockers are, are, are really profitable, and the land business, well, that's, uh, that's kind of the foundation with which all the other, these three are based. Uh, so which one should we consider for elimination? Well, in option number one, okay, what we do is we chop off that stocker arm pretty short. Okay? Now, we're still going to be able to 
get back into the stalker business if we so decide to. But that's the one that we've decided to jump out of first, okay? In option number one. Uh, in option number three, we've decided to get out of the cow-calf business while remaining in the stalker business with the option of using that stalker business to transition back to a cow-calf business. Um, here's something else for you to consider in this. If we looked at this ranch and, and looked at the forage supplies, okay, and the forage supplies on this ranch from a year-round basis, what percent of the forage you think goes to the cow-calf business? What percent of the forage is rolled up in hay bales? And what percent of the forage goes to the stockers? Okay? I think that's an important question to ask. And, and uh, since we don't have a lot of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of draw this out for you. I would think that these pies would look like this, where this green pie here, that's going to be our cow-calf, our bulls, uh, and, and those types of things. Okay? I would guess on this ranch about 70%, maybe 80% of the forage resources are devoted to the cow-calf business. Okay? And so my, my pie chart may not be exactly right. I would guess this smallest wedge here is probably the hay. This ranch only puts up 400 ton of hay. That's not a whole lot. And then the remaining chunk, and I think I might have drawn this too big if we actually did an analysis on this. But the point is, the vast majority of forage, remember that it's what's paying this land business, the vast majority of the forage is being put into the cow-calf business. And that cow-calf business is returning $22,000. Maybe about 20 to 30% of the remaining forage is being put into the stalker business, and that business on average is returning $30,000. And then the small sliver has a negative return. So what I'm suggesting by showing this is that on this business, the most efficient business by probably a tenfold margin is the stalker business because it takes a small percentage of the investment from this ranch, okay, this land business, this uh, AUMs, this uh, tons of forage, whatever you want to call it, it takes that investment and it's turning it into an average of $30,000 a year. The cow-calf business, while it is, it is fairly profitable numbers-wise, when you look at the investment going into that, boy, that's not a very profitable enterprise when you lay it next to the stocker enterprise. Okay? So what I'm suggesting is on this ranch, and I'm not suggesting this is true for your ranch, but on this ranch, the stocker business is the most efficient business, hands down, easy to see. So are we right to get out of the stocker business in option number one here in order to save the cow-calf business? Again, I'm not going to suggest what's the right option, what's the wrong option, but I am saying it may not make sense from a purely business side to eliminate the most effective business on the ranch, uh, the most efficient business on the ranch at returning a profit in order to save a much less efficient business on the ranch. Now, maybe your numbers are flipped and maybe that argument would be vice versa for you. But again, that's well, the point is, I think having these numbers and this information make these kind of decisions you can make them from a more informed place. Okay? Um, so, a few closing thoughts on, on drought management here. Um, first of all, we focused on um, depopulating the herd, selling animals. Okay? We've talked about selling cows, we've talked about selling yearlings, we've talked about selling everything. Those are all depopulation decisions. Okay? We're going to depopulate the ranch. When we get into drought and we start talking shortage, forage shortages, you have to destock the ranch. You don't have to depopulate the ranch. Those, are, those two decisions are not the same decision. They're very different decisions from an economic perspective. Depopulating the ranch is a different decision than destocking the ranch. So what does that mean? That means investigate sending the cows to camp, okay? Sending those animals somewhere else to graze for, for a time period until perhaps we're out of this drought when that comes, and, and that is it's definitely something worth investigating. Again, it's something you have to run one of these types of analyses on, sit down, put the pros on one side, the cons on the other, look at the economics of it. We know it's going to cost us $400 a cow in order to save these remaining 200 and uh, 40 pairs, okay? So what's it, what would it cost us if we sent these cows somewhere else for the next nine months or whatever, okay? Again, those can be emotionally difficult decisions to make, uh, but I think we need to make them from a financial basis as well. So, uh, Another thing to consider is just because 
you're not in the cow-calf, the hay, and the stalker business, if you decided to execute something like option two, you still can be in the land business, and you can still be sitting on a good supply of forage when the rains come, okay? And hopefully they'll, they'll come next spring, and next spring we'll have a lot of grass, okay? So is it a bad situation to have a lot of grass and not your own animals? I don't think so. In fact, I think the way this market is working, uh, that would be a very good situation to be in. Uh, I think this rancher, at least in southeastern Wyoming, could consider taking in cattle. If he wanted to go with cow-calf pairs, I think he could look at anywhere uh, 30 35 maybe even $40 a month per cow-calf pair, uh, providing full care to those animals. And I think there would be ranchers lined up from around the, around the country to bring him, bring him animals at that price. Uh, so what would the profitability of this ranch look like? if they were just in the grass business and if all they did was graze other folks' cattle. Well, I would suggest maybe the 68000 if we did that, at those kind of prices, might be doubled. This ranch might be making 120000 a year at those kind of prices, running someone else's cattle with less risk, less capital, and probably less work involved as well. So I think there's a lot of different things that a person can look at. Instead of just running cows, maybe we can look at uh, expanding the stalker business. If we think that business is, is going to be profitable in the long run, and I think it is, I think there's some uh, fundamentals with the corn price and the value of the gain that have changed that are going to make stalker businesses very profitable in the long run. I think you need to do some things to protect that risk exposure, uh, looking at ways of doing price protection with perhaps a put option or a contract of some type. But using those types of things, I think we can still count on a healthy profit in the stalker business. So if this rancher decided to execute something like option two and get out of the cow business, there are certainly opportunities looking forward to make this ranch very profitable uh, the next year when we get grass, if we get grass, uh, moving forward. One more thing to note, if we decide to go with something like option like drought, uh, option number one, where we're feeding our way through this drought and putting a lot of money in these cows and hoping that the prices remain high over the next three or four years to where we can recoup that $400 investment, we're also doubling down our bet that it's going to rain next year. So if we spend a lot of money putting, uh, keeping these cows and then we get another drought again next year, where does that leave us in terms of financial reserves, in terms of uh, where does this market tend to go? Okay? All those kind of things are questions. So really we're doubling down our bet that it's going to rain next year when we're doing something like option number one. Again, I'm not saying that that's not something to consider. I think definitely it is something to consider. But there's pretty high risk involved here when we're putting a lot of capital into keeping these animals that we have. Uh, so I think we need to recognize that risk. Is there risk here? Yeah. I mean, this market might take back off, and we might not have the opportunity to get back into it, if that's what our goal is, uh, for years down the road, unless we choose to buy in at a higher price. Um, where is this line likely to go? I'll let other economists comment on that. Uh, but as I see a line that goes up and looks like that, um, it just makes me wonder where that line's headed. So um, just some things to think about there. I hope we've given you some things to think about. Uh, hopefully this video will be tied in with videos from, uh, from my colleagues across the state, and we'll have some resources for you. Uh, also linked in here, I'm sure, will be the, the large selection of drought management publications that are available from the University of Wyoming. So do take the time to read through those. There's articles on tax implications, articles on long-run analyses of these types of reactions, whether it makes more sense to feed or to sell animals or, or to do whatever uh, that, that have been put together by economists. So uh, you can look through those and, and see what their numbers are suggesting. If there's anything that UW Extension can do to help you, please contact your local Extension office and uh, they'll put you in touch with the right person. So from the University of Wyoming Extension, this is Dallas Mount uh, helping you navigate some drought management options during this tough year.